How will we remain useful and relevant in the AI future? When artificial beings do things faster, cheaper, and better, how do humans compete? What happens to us when the things that we create dominate the world that we live in. Kevin Legrander has thought deeply about this and has developed the concept of reverse mimesis. First, we create AI that talks and eventually moves and looks like us. Then, we have to adapt ourselves to exist in a world full of these creations. We have to become more like the AI that we ourselves have created. Are we looking at a future cyborgization of humanity? A transformation of our ways of thinking and of our physical bodies and genetic codes to make us more like the AI that we are busily creating? We talked with Legrandeur about the perils and the promises of this coming age of reverse mimesis. We started by asking him to define the term. Mimesis starts with us making machines that imitate us, but they get so good that we then have to start imitating them. So that's a simple explanation. It would have been better if I had called it the cyborgization of human beings, the enforced cyborgization of human beings. That's my key point is that we're being, it's being forced on us. We're going to be left, I think, and so does Elon Musk. I think he's right at least partially when he says that in order to survive AI, we're going to have to compete with them by taking on forms of AI ourselves and implanting them in ourselves so that we can upgrade ourselves to become like AI. So he's basically advocating reverse mimesis, imit reverse imitation, or cyborgization, as you said. Legrande linked the notion of cyborgization to wider ideas of the post-human. He told us that there are several areas of confusion and of ethical concerns surrounding these theories. Post-human is the project of making human beings into a different kind of species that's upgraded with technology. But post-humanism is what comes after humanism. I think the post-human is more intriguing. Some people call it experimental uh, post-humanism or speculative post-humanism because it's about the transformation of our species. And would that work? And would it be a good thing or a bad thing? Most of the post-humanists I know who still write about it, they're all philosophers for the most part. They're very utopian about this. I'm not so sure. It's kind of like they recycled the age of Aquarius and added technology. <laughs> and, and that's what post-humanism has become. But I think, as I, as I said in the, my last, that publication you read, um, Reverse Mimesis, uh, I was saying that if we take on technology, yes, that's going to change us. And maybe as a species, if all of us have the same technology embedded, but there are all kinds of unforeseen, unknown unknowns that can come up. And, you know, some ethical questions crop up for me. One of them is, who gets the goodies? You know, is it only the rich people uh, who get this stuff? Also, posthumanism is tied in with longevity research. People like Ray Kurzweil and do you really want to live 400 years? Mm. Using technology to extend lives is a big thing. Posthumanists think of uploading their brain into a robotic body. That's what mm. Ray Kurzweil wants to do. Ethical questions crop up. Who gets to do that? How expensive is that going to be? What, the, what are the costs to being human of uploading yourself into a robotic body or into somebody else's body? What really concerns Legrander are the iniquities and the coercive pressures that cyborgization will create. As we modify ourselves to more closely resemble our AI companions, we will create new economic and social classes between the enhanced and the non-enhanced. To compete or just to keep up, we will have to embrace cyborgization. But what if not everyone can or not everyone wants to? I think, as, as you're implying, there are a lot of downsides implicit in taking on board our selves, our bodies and our brains, if it take on board, if we take on board technology, whether it's medical technology or digital technology, there are always unforeseen downsides to that. There's a, there was a famous episode about five to six years ago where a rogue scientist in China, he started without permission doing experiments on children that were genetic, and he tried to, to make them impervious to AIDS by changing one uh, set of genes that would then make them immune to, to AIDS. 
naturally. The problem is, is that by altering these genes, they found out there's also corollary to altering their intelligence. Essentially, by genetically modifying the children against the disease, he was also making them naturally more intelligent. Mm. So he was creating gifted children. Now, think about the inequities in a communist society for that. So that got him in trouble with the government and he got pulled out of his, uh, he he was vilified and pulled out of his uh, position at the university he was at. But I mean, that's an unforeseen circumstance and that would make some parents very happy. Oh, good. You know, modify my child and make them smarter. But then what does that do to the rest of society? Mm -hmm. What does that mean for the children who can't afford to get that modification or who just don't have the access? These are things that keep me up at night. And, you know, going back to what you're saying about my essay about modification, reverse mimesis, which is about modifying ourselves digitally or with chemicals or with genetic modification in order to enhance ourselves to make ourselves more like AI so we can compete with them. That's also problematic for the same, what that, for that reason, but also because you're changing the nature of, of a human mm. to something else something other. And we don't know if that'll be a good thing or a bad thing. If I, just to take one modification that's digital, I talked a lot in various articles about Elon Musk's company Neuralink. He put a hundred million dollars of his own money into that. And it's kind of been out of the news lately, but that product he started with, which he calls Neural Lace, was actually a device that was invented at Harvard University by a team led by Charles Lieber. Basically, what Lieber uh, made was a very fine mesh that you could drop into the brain and it would become a Wi-Fi antenna. And you would communicate uh, instantaneously with digital devices external to your body. So, I mean, all kinds of ramifications there. Musk liked that. He adopted it. And eventually, the plan was by Lieber that the mesh would be so fine it could be rolled up into a syringe and injected into the carotid artery, therefore non-invasive surgery. It would go up to the brain, unfold, and be assimilated to the brain. Now, all of that works except for injecting it. So right now they have to drill a hole in your head. The thing is, there. here's an unforeseen circumstance. Lieber did not talk in his, I read his article, about the fact that that mesh only survives for about six months before the body dissolves it. And you have to have the surgery all over again, or the implantation through the carotid artery. So you have to keep re-implanting this Wi-Fi antenna or come up with a new type of uh, material that won't dissolve by the human body. But the human body attacks anything that's placed inside of it. So nobody talks about that. The other thing is Musk realized, to his delight, that one of the implications if, if 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 everybody had or anybody who had this Wi-Fi antenna implanted in their brain would be able to through digital means, uh, digital networks to communicate telepathically and instantaneously with each other. Now he thought that would be great because it would speed up our abilities and make us more like AI, but it would also, for instance, invade our privacy. How do you shut down that thing so people don't read your mind all the time? How do, how do you start inter, interfacing or interacting with other human beings if they know instantly what you're thinking and you're trying to be a little, say, polite or diplomatic? Diplomacy in total falls apart. So does, how do you have politics if you can read other people's minds? So he, did, he doesn't talk about that stuff because he... He's too excited about the positive possibilities. 